or even cartoons on the family television. I am the, the Angel Gabriel. Animal Gore is by far one of the scariest subgenres, and I tend to appreciate it extra due to it being the last piece of fiction that was able to genuinely invoke terror in me without just using jump scares, because in reality, jump scares play simply on your raw instincts, and don't get me wrong, I like jumping out of my chair and screaming as much as the next guy, but this was different. My first experience with analog horror had me genuinely shook, and years later, I feel the need to go back and take a logical look into some of these series is to see if they're actually as terrifying as we once thought. And with that, taking a logical approach on what should have been done in each series to survive. And from that, ranking them on a scale of how screwed characters like Mark Heathcliff really were. Welcome, I'm Mr. Mirage, and this is a logical approach to analog horror. Before I get started, I think it's important to know I will only be using the information provided in the official theories to make logical guesses as to how these creatures work. I encourage you to take what I say with a grain of salt as they are just an educated guess. With that being said, we begin with the first series known by Gemini Home Entertainment, a YouTube channel that began posting short, informative tapes around 2019 regarding, uh... Space and stuff. If you aren't familiar, Gemini Home Entertainment represents the horrific response humanity has to a slow but potent end of the world scenario. It starts small, with rare sightings in a small family summer camp. Locals then start to hear myths about skinwalkers that have been causing disappearances, eventually closing the place down. But it doesn't stop there. Wilderness explorers begin to start having chilling discoveries of parasitic plants that latch onto humans using them as a continuous energy source while the victim is slowly digested, all while still being alive. Giant creatures that can move across any terrain at will are found at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, as well as deep underground, and with it, a massive garden of sorts of an unknown substance seems to be corrupting Earth's core itself. Many privately owned companies begin trying their own methods of research, including AI communication, TV programs, janky products, and even a space venture. And what they find is disturbing. The iris is with us now, laughing at us. The iris appears to be a massive sentient planet-like mass that can travel from system to system, having an obscene effect on the planets and moons it encounters, and the Earth is its next target. In order to approach this scenario logically, we need to take a look at the biggest threats to see if it is even possible to avoid it. It seems like Gemini Home Entertainment itself represents a neutral media company that is willing to share any information about the iris, whether something helpful or something designed to lure you to your death. One of the scariest parts of this scenario is the fact that the iris is fully aware of human life, even sending humanoid creatures referred to as the well-dressed men to attempt to communicate with humans on Earth. And to attempt to save themselves, many companies have begun making videos to lure unsuspecting humans to their death. Humanity repeatedly tries to find a way around this, but nothing seems to work, and to make matters worse, there is a disease being spread through any contact with these beings, one that when contracted will eventually mutate your entire body into one of these creatures. So to recap, it sounds like we may be fucked. The species is superior to humans in every regard. Logically, in apocalypse scenarios, the cast would typically find somewhere safe, like a barren location of Earth, or an underground bunker. but. Our options are very limited, we are not safe underwater, they can reach us underground, and it's obvious they are capable of tearing through thick metal walls of say a nuclear bunker. These creatures referred commonly as wood crawlers, also known as gardeners, and in more specific cases the wretch are the ultimate hunter, 
we can only assume that the average human interaction with these creatures is similar to the character known as Jack in the series, as a good portion of the tapes filmed are through his perspective, suggesting that he was attempting to understand these things, that is, before he contracted the disease, and became part of the garden. Alternatively, the other main character known as Mary seemed to meet a much worse fate being absorbed into this massive abomination known as the Wretch that seems to be yet another threat humanity is faced with. We learn that it was created as a punishment for humanity for sacrificing a bear rather than a human at the light of ones who made those deals I mentioned earlier. And now we have faced a giant amalgamation much larger than the average woodcrawler or gardener. So, could someone survive this? And while it may be difficult, the key would be to recognize it early on. The first step would be figuring out a way around deep root disease. According to the wiki, deep root disease starts with human contact with any of the form of roots. This includes infected people, wood crawlers, and especially nature's mockery. To avoid this, I would assume an industrial grade hazmat suit could possibly stop the parasitic agent from reaching your skin. It is shown in the tape labeled Deep Root Disease that the roots start incredibly slow until they come into contact with the host bone structure, which seems to be its ideal environment. Roots similar to leeches can be forcefully removed, and if it comes into contact and grabbed quick enough, would not reach your skin and not be able to spread through the host body. But to be safe, I still wouldn't recommend purposely making contact with nature's mockery. Moving on to our much larger threat, being wood crawlers, it is unknown whether these creatures have flying abilities, but they have confirmed to be able to move quick distances in short amounts of time, making running from them nearly impossible. So in summary, if they want to catch you, you will be caught. Woodcrawler's primary objective is to spread the previously mentioned disease while removing the host's skin and inhabiting them like a husk, which leads us to fake people. Fake people are the result of a human that has been entered by a woodcrawler. They have extremely stiff movements and are designed to lure other humans in to continue the cycle. So if you weren't convinced you can't trust other humans before, you definitely should keep your distance from any unfamiliar person now. And while a hazmat suit could definitely prevent infection from passive nature's mockery, or the average root laying here or there, a woodcrawler could most definitely pierce your skin through the suit. There are two ways that I could possibly see being able to survive an encounter with a woodcrawler, and to summarize, just don't encounter woodcrawlers. As mentioned before, if they see you, you're already dead. But all hope is not lost. We simply need to make sure that doesn't happen. It seems woodcrawlers are more active at night, as well as preferring dark wooded areas, as hinted at with one of the cruel games they designed to lure kids to be eaten, known by Feed the Forest. So staying away from any wooded areas, especially at night, could limit an encounter. The question then arises, where would you hide at night? Because, as stated in Home Invasion Help, it is not uncommon for woodcrawlers to burrow into homes and create nests during the night. But in this, we also get a glimpse of the woodcrawler's sight and how they view humans. To me, this bears a shocking similarity to thermal vision, leading me to believe the only way to hide from one of these disturbing creatures would be to block or intercept the infrared radiation, which is another way of saying heat, from being detected. Now. You can do this by hiding behind solid walls or ground, but that is not the most practical option as it would be extremely impractical to say constantly have to drive around in a mobile home or a really big truck or U-Haul. Although that could be a viable option for having a safe place to sleep as it is elevated off the ground and would protect you from being seen by a wandering woodcrawler. However, there is something else we are overlooking here. If it was as easy as not letting a woodcrawler see you, they wouldn't be as big of a threat. Due to them being able to strategically burrow into houses, it is assumed that they rely on a sense of hearing and a sense of smell as well. In the tape labeled Storm Safety Tips, you are given shady vague details on how to survive a woodcrawler entering your home. But there is one thing that stood out to me the most. leads me to believe that woodcrawlers has a sensitivity to picking up the smell of salt, which makes sense as salt is present in the majority of living beings. Harbin's Technologies also recommends turning on a short range radio in the event a woodcrawler enters your bunker. Although it is not directly mentioned and it is stated, ignore the noises, these are auditory hallucinations, which if that sounds familiar, is the same message stated when the fake person was crying out for help in another tape. 
leading me to believe that this noise is playing from the radio and could trick the woodcrawler into believing it has stumbled into a fake human and to move on to the next target. Now, it is unsure whether these tricks actually work, as in the corresponding video game, Lethal Omen, it shows a woodcrawler easily puncturing the outer wall of a bunker. However, if you notice, it does not kill you, rather it retreats and you are able to leave the bunker unharmed. While this could be just be a coincidence, I see it as a nudge to the radio being an effective measure of convincing woodcrawlers you are one of them, which is not an uncommon method of deterring swarms in other apocalypse scenarios, such as in World War Z. But that still leaves the question of smell. We can assume that simply not crying and wearing the hazmat suit from before would be the only way to neutralize your smell as much as possible, since there are not many hints to how strong their sense of smell really is. Now, these might just be very vague ways of avoiding wood crawlers, but the logical way to go about this is to just adjust ourselves to not being at the top of the food chain. Wood crawlers are obviously a predator to humankind, so coming up with tricks to avoid their gaze, smell, and hearing is the best we could do to limit the chances of becoming their next victim. Throughout the series, we never see thick protective suits being used, nor do we ever see wood crawlers having a keen interest in cars. Well, except one. The wretch as mentioned before is assumed to be a single entity capable of absorbing affected humans, and of devouring anything in its path. It is shown to be massive and have tentacles, but other than that, it is mostly unknown. My best advice with the limited knowledge given is to hope that its massive size and limited quantity would make it harder to spot you and easier to be seen, along with having limited mobility compared to wood crawlers. If you are unlucky enough to come into contact with this thing, don't stay indoors and hope it is more attracted to everyone around you and run for your fucking life. Gemini Home Entertainment has yet to be finished and still leaves many things up in the air. But I think that if some of the characters in the series use some of these tips, they might have had a better chance of surviving. Slightly. But to be honest, it seems like this is just going to keep getting worse and worse until the entire Earth belongs to the Iris. So I would give this one a 9 on the Warfuck scale, due to the fact that it's probably inevitable that the Earth's going to end. We are currently receiving countless reports of an unidentified hostile organism that we'll refer to as alternates. With the Mandel catalog being one of the most popular and iconic analog horror series, is, along with the first one that I came into contact with, I had to add it to this video. If you've made it this far, there's a good chance you're familiar with the series already, so I'll keep the summary brief. The Mandela Catalog begins with a government alert style broadcast warning the populace of Mandela and the surrounding counties to be aware of an unknown threat that seems to have taken a ground zero in Mandela County. The police refuse to help for reasons that I'll go over later, and the best suggestion the government can give is to run away and hide, with the secondary option of neutralizing the threat with a firearm. Self-harm related deaths start to skyrocket as well as random disappearances of children. The threat is unknown, but is referred to as alternate, and can somehow look identical to people you know, but at the exact same time, can also possess biologically impossible characteristics. So, try to get a good view of the As you can tell, we have a lot to unpack here. To even begin to decipher a method of survival, we need to figure out what this alternate even is. What some people who aren't deep divers may not know, is that an alternate is not a specific creature, rather four types that are all classified under the same name. Most of which are shown in volume 1, two are relatively simple. They either look identical to a normal person or are classified as a type 1 or doppelganger, or they don't, and they possess biologically impossible characteristics, such as very long limbs, large heads, and those goddamn eyes. These would be referred to as a type 3 or a flawed impersonator. The remaining two types are definitely a little bit more interesting, being unspeakable and tulpa. Starting with the latter, tulpas are essentially alternates that don't possess a physical form. They are said to use extreme measures of fear and manipulation tactics in order to lure children to disappear, leading to, in some cases, their parents taking their own lives. Tulpas haven't completely been deciphered, but YouTubers like Wendigoon have theorized that all alternates may begin in a similar form, eventually becoming a type 1 or 3 when they have gained a physical form, usually after the death of said victim. This is the base of a type 4 alternate. The final form, unspeakable, is unique, because we only see one alternate who officially belongs to this class. I am the, a the Angel Gabriel. I've come to bring good news. News? For me? No, he's not. Uh, 
Now, in order for this class to make sense, I feel like I need to mention this series has some serious religious undertones. And I'm not just theorizing that. Like, religion is brought up in the background over and over again. Rather than an alien presence like Gemini Home Entertainment, alternates are hinted to be more of a demonic entity, dating back to the birth of Christ. It is assumed that in this reality, the alternate Gabriel took his place as the savior of humanity. Well, in his eyes he did at least. After which he immediately began this cycle of manipulation as the first alternate. And with this, we have a confirmation that alternates, at least in the type 2 variant, are immortal. Keep this in mind for later. It's obvious that alternates have a common goal of replacing humans to manipulate and end the life of other humans, and in turn, create more alternates. But since we are seeing this in the beginning stages, we don't really have an idea on if it could spread outside of Mandela County. So wouldn't the simple answer be just not enter Mandela County? Or if you found yourself there, simply leave? Well, if it was as easy, I wouldn't have added this series in the video. Alternates similar to spirits have the tendency to choose a victim and latch onto them. We've seen multiple times alternates possessing abilities to follow someone even through a car, especially when a tulpa is present. The most logical way to disrupt a tulpa is avoidance. The tulpa's main way of killing is manipulation through the means of metaphysical awareness disorder, more briefly known as MAD. This is a psychological disease that is often contracted from an alternate and in 97% of cases results in the death of the victim by their own hands. This is often conducted via various methods, most notably telling them something they don't want to hear, or using the lives of loved ones against them, with the first bringing up the most concern. In the corresponding episode, the recommended ways of overcoming MAD are avoid excessive frequent religious practices, avoiding unnecessary beliefs and philosophical implications, and finally, With this implication, logically I can assume MAD possesses similarities to real life schizophrenia, causing paranoia and the constant appearances of hallucinations or in this case, alternates wherever you go. It is suggested that alternates discover one's fear and add it on as a factor in their manipulation tactics. And due to the religious practices comment, this leads me to believe alternates will use any strong beliefs in order to cause the victim to suddenly lose hope, maybe even revealing the truth about Gabriel. Alternates are rarely shown to use blunt force to kill, although as seen in volume 2 and 4, we know it is possible. Now that we kind of have an understanding of the alternates and how they work, what is the smartest method of surviving an alternate encounter? Well to start, we can assume these creatures don't prefer physical killing due to scenes such as the death of Mark Heathcliff, showing alternates refusing to break his door down, and preferring rather to torture him into contracting mad. Using Mark as an example, we can also see that due to small details like an empty gun cartridge being discovered surrounding Mark's body, as well as an obvious lack of health from law enforcement, reinforcing the two solutions given by the original broadcast, are as simply coping mechanisms and not actually realistic ways of survival. It is worth mentioning the police are not refusing help out of being in bed with Gabriel and the alternates, but rather they realize more than most. The best way to survive an alternate encounter is to avoid them entirely. Tulpas are purely fabricated by fear and use electronics and mirrors to manipulate victims. If you are able to prevent an alternate from gaining a physical form, your chances of survival increase dramatically. Simply destroying all mirrors and screens is a radical but effective way of eliminating the chance of you or a loved one encountering a tulpa. Rather than the suggestions made by the broadcast before, urging citizens to prepare an alternate panic room may prove to be of use, especially for their physical form. This could be as simple as a well-lit soundproof padded room that isolates you from anything that could be used to harm yourself should an alternate successfully inflict you with mad. Staying in numbers also seems to be a good idea. Throughout the series, alternates never seem to attack people in groups, and it is unknown whether they are able to inflict mad on multiple people simultaneously, as it would be much harder if someone was there to convince them and provide help. And as for a means of getting police and an ambulance to arrive, just lie to them. Imagine a fire or other non-break-in related emergency and assistance is more likely to be sent and the more people that are there, the harder it would be for an alternate to have full effect on any of the victims. Now, these are very hypothetical solutions that would rely on a lot of theories being true. There is still the question of whether tulpas can assume a physical form as shown with the intruder having both a spiritual and obvious physical form as it was able to torment Mark as a kid and kidnap thousands of children along with whether alternates have a vulnerability to being killed. 
due to them technically possessing human bodies, with Gabriel and Type 2s assumably being the exception. Logically, I would assume that people just haven't been able to kill them due to their intense maneuverability and prowess in psychological torment, along with using your fear against you. Regardless, since preventing an alternate from ever assuming physical form is nearly impossible, using common sense to avoid suspicious situations such as ghost cats in an empty house, or going over to your friend's house after his mom had an emergency just to turn his cameras on, would honestly be the smartest course of action, because if an alternate has no contact with you, it cannot learn your fears and will have a harder time manipulating you. If this sounds familiar, this is the exact thought process behind why the police will not even stay on the phone with someone who is having an alternate encounter. It is even stated that when they're on a phone with someone who is coming in contact with an alternate, don't let them hear your fear, because then they'd be able to learn it, and be able to manipulate you as well. Because of this, I would honestly rate Mandela Catalog a 7 on the we're fuck scale, making Gemini Home Entertainment the more dangerous of the two. If you want me to do a part 2, adding more analog horror series to the list, let me know in the comments below. And don't be afraid to hit that subscribe button if you enjoyed my analysis. Well that was quite an adventure. I'm sad to see you go, but don't worry, this doesn't have to be the last time we see each other. I got another cool video, just for you. Hurry, the video's almost over.